Is it really true that nothing works when it comes to programs targeted at helping the formerly incarcerated reintegrate successfully into society and avoid new crimes? As with most social policy questions, the answer is complicated. On the one hand, nearly 600,000 Americans return from prison each year. Of those, about two-thirds will be rearrested for a new offense within three years, and many of those in the first few months. Most of our efforts to change those outcomes have failed as measured in randomized control trial evaluations. Paradoxically, alongside Nothing Works is an extensive literature called What Works. These papers highlight the fact that while few comprehensive reentry programs have demonstrated success in reducing recidivism, some individual practices, substance abuse treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, education programs, and some employment initiatives have been effective in reducing criminal behavior and reincarceration. In short, if we sift through the nothing works data, we often find that some things actually do work. Our challenge is finding ways of connecting individuals with often vastly different backgrounds, needs, skills, and opportunities to a tailored set of programs and services that will increase their chance of success. That's where today's guest on Hardly Working comes in. AEI adjunct scholar Grant Dewey has been on the front line of incarceration research and practice as the director of research for the Minnesota Department of Corrections. In this role, he has overseen the development and implementation of automated risk-need responsivity assessments that use the power of technology to improve our understanding of who needs the most help, what kinds of help will be the most effective, and how best to deliver that help in a way that drives positive outcomes. In addition to his posts in Minnesota and with AEI, Grant is a non-visiting scholar at Baylor University. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Kansas and a PhD in criminology from Florida State University. Grant Dewey, thank you for joining us on Hardly Working. Thank you for having me. You've written this essay for us as part of this volume. Very interesting. I think it's particularly interesting because it comes from somebody who is a researcher, but is a researcher grounded in practice, maybe a little bit more grounded in practice some days than you'd like to be in terms of grappling with some of the challenges in the Minnesota correctional system. And I think that's really valuable perspective for people who are interested in working in this area. It's not enough to have good theory. We have to have good practice as well. So I'd like to just start us off by having you define some of the terms that we're going to be talking through in this conversation. Let's start out with the most basic question. What is the risk principle? Sure. So the risk principle comes from the risk needs responsivity model or the R&R model, which is the prevailing paradigm used to guide the delivery of correctional programming within the U.S. and also Canada and other countries. In order to, to fully understand that, I think it's, it's worth providing a little bit of background on how the R&R model emerged and, and why risk assessment has ended up being so important to the, the corrections field. But back in the, the 1970s, there was a highly publicized report that looked at the effectiveness of correctional programming that existed at that time. And the infamous conclusion from that report was that nothing works. And so it's, it, even to this day, it's known as the, the nothing works report. And there is quite a bit of research that followed in the wake of that report that showed that there are some interventions that produce good outcomes for correctional populations. And, and there are some, some researchers a few out of Canada who looked at that what works literature, which is what it became known as, and and they identified some some common threads that kind of running through effective correctional programs, and they kind of distilled it down to this risk needs responsivity model, which really tells us who, what, and how we should be delivering programming. And so the risk principle focuses on the who, and and that that tells us where we should be putting our programming resources. And more specifically, that the programming resources that we have, which, which are usually pretty limited in, in correctional systems, that those need to be targeted towards those people who are higher risk. You know, higher risk for what? Higher risk for a harmful outcome like misconduct within a prison setting or recidivism, which is someone reoffending with new criminal offenses. And so 
when we're talking about the risk principle, that's assessing people for their risk for an outcome like recidivism or, or misconduct, and then taking the programming resources that we have and concentrating those among the people who are high risk. But the risk principle also tells us about what dosage should be like, dosage in terms of how much programming we provide and, and people who are higher risk, who who are perhaps more enmeshed in a criminal lifestyle, they typically require a greater dosage of programming in order to desist from crime. That's sort of the who of the R&R. Tell us about the, the other two elements. So the needs principle tells us what areas we should try to target for, for intervention. And the, the what works literature has indicated that there are some interventions that, that tend to be effective in, in reducing things like recidivism. And so substance abuse treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, sex offender treatment, some programs relating to education and employment have, have achieved some, some good outcomes. The What Works literature has identified some domains or areas that correctional populations usually have that's related to the recidivism risk. And one of the, the strongest predictors of whether someone recidivates is their prior criminal history. However, that's a static risk factor that we can't change. And so the needs principle, it focuses on those dynamic areas in which changes can ostensibly take place. As one example, substance abuse is a criminogenic needs area, and the extent to which someone used or abused substances in the year before they started probation or in the year before they came to prison may be indicative of whether that person needs substance abuse treatment or needs to participate in order to desist from crime. The responsivity principle essentially tells us how we should be delivering programming to individuals, and more specifically that we should try to tailor it to the strengths, learning styles, and abilities of people who are on probation or who are in prison. And the responsivity principle essentially helps us when we assess for that. It can potentially help identify programs or interventions that would be most beneficial in achieving good outcomes for that person. Okay, so that that gives us the framework. You know, the risk principle is focusing on who's the riskiest, you know, identifying who the riskiest are and making sure that we are devoting the limited resources we have to that population because those are the people who are going to create the most problems downstream. And then you've got needs, which are setting aside the things that we can't change. We can't change the past. While prior criminal history tells us who might be most likely to commit new crimes, it doesn't tell us anything about what to do about that. So the needs part is like, what can we do about to alter that likelihood? And responsivity is the how. How do we deliver in a way that will actually make a difference for individuals? This is not new. I mean, as you pointed out, this discussion has been going on since the 1970s. This is not new. What's the history of the use of risk-need responsivity assessments? Two Canadian researchers, Jim Bont and Don Andrews, have created risk assessments that are widely used in Canada and the United States, but they, they identify four generations of risk assessment within, within corrections. And so the, the, the first generation consists of people just using professional or clinical judgment in, in making decisions about what somebody's going to do in the future, sort of like our gut instinct. But then in the 1970s, we start to see the emergence of what Bont and Andrews call second generation risk assessments. And these start using actuarial methods or they're based on statistics in order to identify those factors that that have a statistical relationship with the outcome that's being predicted, in this case, recidivism. One of the criticisms leveled against the second generation assessments is that they they relied almost entirely on static factors. So those second generation assessments would help identify who is more risky or who's less risky, but it didn't provide practitioners with with much information on how to successfully intervene. But then in the 1990s, we begin to see the emergence of third-generation assessments. And these are the assessments that begin to look at risk and needs 
and really start to incorporate not just static risk factors, but also dynamic ones too. And then more recently, or we're currently in the midst of fourth generation assessments, which are, are very similar to third generation, where they're, they're still risk and needs assessments that, that incorporate static and dynamic risk factors, but then they're also designed to be administered multiple times to the same person from from intake to case closure. And they've also attempted to focus a little more on including protective factors or those factors that, that reduce a person's risk for misconduct or recidivism. So we're used to actuarial estimates in a lot of different areas of life. We use them in insurance. We use them in lending. We use them in health outcome predictions and in designing interventions around health. Why are risk assessments so controversial in the criminal justice field? I think there are several reasons why it has recently become more controversial within criminal justice. And I think Part of it is the is the bias and disparity issue, and we can certainly dive into that in more more detail. But then also, we've seen risk assessments being used to to make decisions where there is a liberty interest at stake, where the risk assessment is being used to to either confine someone or or not. And I think as a result of that, we're talking high stakes assessments. And and if there are concerns about bias or disparities, then then I think we need to be explicit about what we're talking about in terms of liberty interests. What do you mean by that? Meaning whether someone will, will be free or whether they will be confined in a correctional facility. Right. So that's whether it's that's jail or like, prison. Whether that yeah, yeah like so that's either that could be either pre trial. You know, whether somebody is allowed out while they're awaiting trial for the crime they've been indicted for or in making decisions about how long they should be in prison. Yeah. And, and the, where it gets controversial is, is really a lot of the focus has been on how risk assessments have been designed. It's like, is the, the algorithm, is it, is it biased? Is the data biased? And, you know, that's where a lot of the focus has been. But I would argue that, that the focus really, that, that more of the focus should be on how we're using the assessments. For, for what purpose are we using them? Because j- just a couple minutes ago, I talked about the third generation and fourth generation risk and needs assessments. And what's important to remember is that in that context, the the risk assessment is being used in order to identify those who need more programming, more intervention, more support. Whereas in the pretrial detention decision that you just mentioned, it's being used for a more punitive purpose. Well, punitive and, and, and kind think, of a public safety yeah, and punitive, deciding how yeah. people are going to pay for the crime that they've committed, basically. Right. And I think that's that's the rub, is, yeah. is how is the assessment being used? And yeah. I think, you know, to some extent, as risk and needs assessments grew in popularity, you know, from the 1990s up through this century, it's sort of a victim of its own success to some extent, where I think you you see, you know, especially with pretrial detention decisions, but also you see some have advocated using risk assessments at, at sentencing. And that's even more controversial, in my opinion, than using it at the, at the pretrial detention phase. Is the use of, the, of an R&R as controversial in the post-sentencing environment where somebody's been detained, we've already made that decision. Is it as controversial as the pretrial and sentencing uses of this? I mean, is it do the opponents of the sentencing side see the virtues of this on the treatment side? I mean, I think yes and no. I think those who who understand the various ways in which these assessments get used would acknowledge that. But I think part of the problem is that because much of the focus has been on how risk assessments are being used for pretrial detention and sentencing decisions, that critics have kind of painted assessments with a broad brush. Right. And so everything kind of gets swept into this discussion about 
risk assessments being being biased and producing worse worse outcomes when the the truth is a a risk needs responsivity assessment used properly is is helping staff make better decisions as to how much programming a person needs what type of programming would be most beneficial in reducing a person's risk because one of the things that we do see is that when we compare like first what what has been called first generation assessments when someone's using their own judgment it produces worse outcomes in comparison to right. actuarial statistical judgment yeah that, and that's um, that was sort of the next thing i wanted to get to which is in your paper you, you make it pretty clear that you believe that these automated rnrs are more reliable than manual ones So you're making an assertion there that a computer or an algorithm is more reliable than a person. I'd like you to really unpack that. Tell us what we we know about that. Well, one thing to clarify at the outset is even, even for an assessment that's done manually, there's still an algorithm that's taking that information and and kind of computing a score. That's still going to be there regardless. And the difference, or at least that, that I contend in the paper is that there are assessments that are manual where you have correctional staff who are either doing like a one-on-one interview with a probationer or a prisoner on their caseload. They're gathering information and they're they're entering that information into the assessment or they're doing a database review or reviews of databases where you're, they're looking for information and they're entering those values into the assessment so that the score or scores can be created. Whereas with an automated approach, it's, it's taking all of the existing data that we already have that have already been entered and it's populating the items on that assessment with the values that we need. And so my contention is that, that using an automated process it's a lot more efficient. It's a lot more cost effective. Assessment is going to be something that correctional systems have to do anyway. And it's just a much better way of doing that. And, and one of the things that I've argued is that because correctional staff, when they're doing manual assessments, a lot of times it's, it's database reviews where they're not, they're not even interacting with the people, prisoners or probationers on their caseloads. And so this actually frees up more time for staff to have face face time with the people on their caseload. So, you know, a lot of times we hear about technology making things more impersonal or distant, whereas the, the intention here is actually to eliminate that that kind of unwieldy part of correctional staff time and, and creating more face time. Right. It's the, the idea in, a, in other work settings, we call it the idea of a cobot where you you have this digital assistant who's handling a lot of data processing activities that a person doesn't actually need to do and allows them to focus on other tasks. So it's in every other field of endeavor, this increases productivity on the job. So I don't see why it would be different here. One other, I think, common misconception is that, you know, a lot of times when people hear hear the word automation, they they think, well, it's going to eliminate jobs. But in this case, you know, we see correctional systems that are so bloated that in general, they're underfunded. So a lot of times when someone's on probation or someone's in prison, they're not getting the the resources that they need. So when you Uh, you say bloated, you're talking about the number of people, not the size of the budget. Yeah. Well, I'm talking that the size of a jurisdiction's probation or prison population right. exceeds what they're able to actually have. Right. When people hear the word bloat, they usually think you're saying we've got too many administrators, we've got too many caseworkers, we've got too many correctional staff. And that's that's not the case. Right. So the needs of, of those who are on probation or in prison exceed what the system's able able to actually provide. What this process can do. It's just it's just one part of making the system more efficient, more cost effective, using the resources that, that we have more effectively. Just because when you've worked in a correctional system, you see up close all of the inefficiencies and waste that go into the provision of correctional services. 
So let me let me take us to the dark side, though. What happens when a computer makes a mistake? What happens when, say, in this in this context, the computer makes a mistake and assigns somebody to a service that maybe they don't need? Maybe it makes their situation worse, which we've seen in some instances. What about that? How do you square that? No system is perfect. And a lot of times when, when we're using assessments, it's based on, on probabilities or, or likelihood. So any assessment that we use is not going to be accurate 100% of the time. But using those is a less flawed, and I would argue more transparent approach than if we had to rely on our own judgment. Are you saying that human beings make mistakes too? Is that <laughs> as difficult as that as that may be? Yes. Yeah, yes, that, I, I, I always go back to the saying. to the automated car or self driving car idea. You know, it's like, oh my god, somebody's going to get killed. And the machine's going to go nuts, which is all true. In fact, there are examples frequently of failures like that where automated processes break down with bad results, mm -hmm. but the car insurance companies are in business for a reason, and it isn't because we've got too many really great drivers. Human beings are making mistakes all the time on the road that result in accidents, many of them fatal. So I agree with you, and I think the point here is that we can imagine nightmare scenarios, and there are going to be mistakes, but that all has to be placed in the context of what we've currently got, which is not great from the standpoint of avoiding mistakes. Right. I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So you talk in the paper about some of the challenges associated with like building these algorithms in a way that as much as possible avoids bias. What are some of those challenges? The challenge, and I don't want to get too technical or, or, or in the weeds here, but I think one of the challenges is just, you know, ensuring that the tool performs well in predicting the outcome that, that you're trying to predict, whether it's, it's misconduct or, or recidivism. And, and I would argue that, that the more significant substantive challenge, and, and I referenced this earlier, comes with how assessments are being used. One of the issues that, that we've seen discussed within, I would say, the last five, six, seven years is the, the notion of fairness. And at least within a correctional context. You can't have an assessment that is both really accurate and produces what are considered fair outcomes at the same time. And I'll unpack that here. And what I mean by that is, is we see disparities in like racial and ethnic disparities in correctional populations, at least in terms of the extent to which, you know, a state's prison population contains people who are white versus other races and ethnicities. And in order to correctly predict what's going to happen in the future, we, we use data that, that we have in the past. And, and so to some extent, when we're assessing risk, we're, we're kind of holding up a mirror to our system and, and to our policies and our practices. In, in quite a few instances, when, when we're holding up that mirror, we don't like what we see. We don't like the, the biases and the discrimination that we see, and for good reason. But, you know, I would argue that the problem with much of the discussion about risk assessment today is focused on finding the solution to these disparities within the algorithm itself. If we just found the right algorithm, that is accurate and fair at the same time, then that would solve everything. And I think that's, I don't know how to put that other than to say it's a fool's errand, because I don't think we can do both at the same time. Instead, it goes back to how are we supposed to use these assessments responsibly? And if someone has a, a higher risk profile because they came from a disadvantaged community in which there is more aggressive policing and therefore they have a longer criminal history, what we know is that individuals often return to the, to the same communities. And so if that community is going to continue to be disadvantaged, 
and subject to more aggressive policing, then that person is going to need more support and more resources yeah. while they're in prison to help them succeed. And so I think that really gets to to how we use these assessments. Not so much, I mean, we, we need to pay attention, of course, to how they're designed. But I think the narrative around this really needs to shift yeah. in terms of how we're using them. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. It reminds me of some of the discussions that I've seen around use of assessments in schools for kids who have learning disabilities. Parents frequently are seeking the highest level of sort of assessment for their kids in terms of their disability to get the services. There's always that connection between if I have an Asperger's diagnosis versus an autism diagnosis, let's say, I'm going to get a lower level of intervention. And so there's almost like we want the higher one because that's going to make sure that our kid gets everything that we need. Yeah. Similar kind of effect here of like, don't worry about bias in the, again, these are the post-sentencing risk assessments because even if you're wrong and rating somebody too high in terms of their risk, you're probably opening doors for them in the process. And I would argue, unfortunately, that's, that's the ideal. Mm-hmm. That's that's how things should work. That's how assessments should be used. Is there any jurisdiction that's using them that way yeah. currently? And I would have to say no. And that's a resource because, question, right? Yeah. Well, it's a resource question. It's a policy and a practice question. And from a certain perspective, I can see where where those those criticisms, and especially if there's a high level of distrust in state or federal government or with correctional systems to to act responsibly, then I can empathize with those criticisms. But I do think the scrutiny that that this area has received, I think it's a clarion call for for those who work not only within the system, but also outside the system to to try to get us to a point where where we are using these assessments in a way that is responsible and ethical. And I just wonder if there's a way of flipping this this concern around and looking at it from a different angle and saying, you know, if we were using these automated post-sentencing algorithms to look at the needs of the prison population, we would probably see, if we sort of aggregated all that data, we would see, wow, look at the need here. Don't look at outcomes right away, but look at the need. And do we actually have alignment between what we're investing in providing interventions, is it any way commensurate with the level of need that prison populations are experiencing? I think the the short answer to that is no. And I've written about this before and I've talked about, you know, at least within Minnesota's prison system that, that you know, research that, that we've done shows that about a third of, of people who, who get released from, from prison were essentially warehoused where they didn't participate in any kind of program or intervention. And I mean, that's not unique to to Minnesota. We know even from a a recent report for the Bureau of Prisons population, we we see that close to half didn't participate in any kind of effective program or, or intervention while they were incarcerated. And that's not that doesn't even factor in for those who who did participate in something. Was it sufficient relative to their need? I would argue no. Part of the problem is that there just aren't enough resources within correctional settings and you have a lot of a lot of people who who aren't doing anything. But then even those who do have access, you know, for someone who is really high risk is participating in say an education program or an employment program or or even you know substance abuse treatment is that going to be enough to get them to desist and and for someone who's really high risk is really enmeshed in a criminal lifestyle the answer is probably going to be no they they're going to need more than that substance abuse treatment program or education or employment program they're going to need all three probably have there been any labor department does this like time studies for people who are in prison, if they're not in programming, what are they doing? What are those hours being filled with? There's only so much television time. What is it that people do? I mean, I think that that's worth asking because I agree. I mean, you look at thinking about the federal prison population. These are people that are in for a fair amount of time. These are not fast turnover. And 
if they're sitting behind bars with no programming and nothing else to do, that just seems like a recipe for disaster. I would agree. You're preaching to the choir on that. Yeah. I don't know if it's whether it's a lack of understanding or not not appreciating how the the supply of resources is so far below what's actually needed to produce good outcomes. Yeah, or even mediocre outcomes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, or you know. <laughs> you're right, or even mediocre outcomes. Yeah, so I, that's why I was curious as to whether you, anybody has ever looked seriously at like how do people who are in prison spend their time. Nick Eberstadt's book on men at work looked at what happens to men who are outside the workforce, uh, have dropped out of the workforce, and how they spend their time. And interesting comparison, you know, women who are out of the workforce, they're working all the time. They're taking care of other people, typically, and they're working really hard. Men, not so much, like less than an hour a day being spent on actual work of any kind, whether that's in the home, volunteering, whatever. And I'm just curious as to whether criminal justice has ever like, seriously looked at that from a prison standpoint, what's going on during all of these unoccupied hours. I'm not aware of any study that has looked at that. I think it's challenging for a lot of correctional systems or prison systems to simply track the programming that they provide. <laughs> I mean, yeah. getting, getting a comprehensive account of that has been very elusive up to this point. Yeah, it's a big system. As I said at the top of this discussion, you're a PhD researcher, but you're embedded in a Department of Corrections in the state of Minnesota, and you've experimented extensively with these automated R&Rs. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned. I think what may have surprised me the most is the impact that the use of automated assessments would have on our assessment capacity. Because when we used a manual process, there were quite a few people who would come into prison who would never get assessed for anything. By virtue of Minnesota DOC policy, if anyone came into prison for less than six months and they weren't getting assessed for recidivism risk or getting any kind of needs assessment or, or anything like that. But about nearly half of Minnesota DOC releases come to prison for less than six months. So by using a manual process, a manual assessment process and having that policy, there were a lot of people who were never getting assessed. And I think, you know, what's interesting is one of the assumptions was that those people who would come into prison and wouldn't stay very long, these short-term offenders, were relatively lower risk. You know, there's kind of this assumption that if someone's in prison for a longer period of time, then, then they, they must be higher risk. And these shorter-term people must be lower risk. Right. But once we automated the process, basically everybody now gets assessed. Mm -hmm. And what became very apparent is not only the the impact that it had on our assessment capacity, but you know we're starting to look at people who are in for short periods of time are not low risk. And in fact, the opposite's true, that the people who are in for shorter periods of time tend to be higher risk than those who are, who are in for longer periods of time. And, and part of this, again, you know, risk assessment is kind of holding up a mirror to the system. And as a system, you know, I would say, Minnesota's prison system, which many many would consider to be fairly progressive within the U.S. prison system, has policies that don't necessarily yield good outcomes. And, you know, as an example, people who go on probation or who go on supervised release, which is similar to parole, they get revoked and then they return to prison for maybe 70 days, 90 days, 120 days. But while they're in prison, they, they weren't actually doing anything. They weren't participating in any kind of programming or any interventions. And, and our research has shown that when someone gets revoked and they come to prison for a short period of time, they don't do anything, they get warehoused, it actually makes outcomes worse. So our risk assessment was, has been right on the money where you know these people are higher risk. And part of it is because we're, we're sort of contributing to that. We're creating that situation. Has that resulted in any changes in practice? in terms it, of these short timers? There are efforts currently underway to try to change those, those policies and practices and greatly reducing revocations. There's still a lot of work 
that needs to happen in order for that change to take place. I can say there's, there is certainly interest in changing our policies and our practices. That's around. sort of the, the front end question, but I mean, what about, is it changing what we're doing with people when they do get revoked and they're inside and they're going to be there for 30, 60, 90, 120 days? Is Minnesota trying to do more with those people? Well, I think in Minnesota, the, the goal is not to have those people come back at all. Right. I mean, usually an effective intervention lasts at least three months. So if you're going to revoke someone and put them in prison for 70 days, they're not going to be able to participate in any kind of effective intervention that might reduce their risk. And so, and especially if someone is, is lower risk and their, their violations of supervision were low severity, then those are people who should remain in the community and be, be given access to, to resources right. there in the community. as opposed yeah. to using an, ex, an expensive resource like prison and just having them sit there. Yeah, and, I guess and, my, my question was more going to like a lesson until those policies really change and we stop revoking people and putting them back behind bars. We still, I take it that that's in process. That's not a thing that's complete yet. So yep. I'm just wondering if it had changed. It hasn't. There have been a few small scale changes to try to reduce the extent to which revocations or to make it more difficult to revoke lower risk, lower severity vi violations. I would argue that the state still has a long ways to go to get to a point where where prison is a place where if someone enters prison, then they will get access to resources that can potentially reduce their risk. And, and essentially, we're trying to excise that part of the prison experience mm -hmm. that our research suggests is criminogenic. In our working group, as we were kind of trying to think through what some innovative approaches might be, and we, we sort of went down this path with Sean Bushway and Christy Vischer and you around this question of how do we foster identity change, which is really the, the cornerstone of successful desistance. You have to give up a criminal identity and you have to replace it with a non-criminal identity that I, this is not the person. I, I used to be that person. I'm not that person anymore. Do you see a role for R&R &R assessments in helping to identify where people are on that trajectory? of identity change? I think there's potentially a role there, but I think there are a couple of issues. One is the insight about identity transformation comes from the desistance literature, which has been relatively distinct from the what works literature, which is where the focus on assessment comes from. I don't think there's even been much attention for those who do assessments to even try to assess for for something like identity transformation or to to try to I don't know if if predicting it would would be the right phrase for that but I just don't think there's been there's been much attention from from those who are are steeped in the what works literature that identity transformation is is a very key component of the process by which people desist yeah, I mean, it's a concept that, that could be important, but to this point, just hasn't received much attention, if any. Yeah, and it isn't even so much like predictive. I'm really fascinated with that, this idea of detection. How could you listen to someone in a way that would start to tell you kind of whether they are in this process or whether they're still in that I'm not ready to change stance? that just makes it very difficult to extract anybody from a criminal lifestyle, as you point out in your essay. So it's not really like predictive, but kind of like, what would it look like to have a mechanism for assessing the change process? Like anyway. Are they, are they open? Yeah, they open the openness. Change? Yeah, exactly. Or what, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Or what would like Sean Bushway and Ray Paternoster have crystallization of discontent where they... Yeah. In other words, they're so fed up with where they are and they don't, they don't want to become this person that they're afraid of becoming. And so they're at that point where there is some openness for, for change. Right. And so I would imagine that there would be a way to 
to potentially assess for that. And that could be that could be part of the needs assessment process because you know one of the things that you'll hear correctional staff talk about is whether you know is whether someone is is ready and and motivated for change and for participating in programs. And and that's such an intangible. I mean, it's, you know, you talk about how difficult it is to get an algorithm to detect risk and need and responsivity. I mean, that that's a whole different ballgame of like, you know, are they motivated? (laughs) That's a vague, loose and indeterminate question to be asking, but it's vital in terms of deciding who's really open to the services that you're trying to provide. Okay. Well, Grant, thank you so much for your time today. This has been, as always, excellent and stimulating, thought-provoking discussion. Just want to thank you again for all of your work and your partnership in trying to make things better, not just for people who are in prison, but really for the whole country. Thank you, Brent. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hardly Working. I'm your host, Brent Orell, and I hope you tune in next time to learn more about the state of workforce development in America. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast. Let us know at vocation at AEI.org if there are any topics you'd like us to cover. As always, we hope you find the job that fits so well, it feels like you're hardly working.